good morning, everybody. How are you? I'm Tim. Good to see you. Got a question? When you face adversity, how do you respond? When you face adversity, how do you typically respond? As I was looking through this last chapter of 2 Timothy this week, my mind went back to a story of a friend of mine from a little ways back uh, named Bruce. And uh, Bruce was a guitar player on the worship team I was a part of uh, for many years. And one of the things that I always appreciated about Bruce is he was an excellent guitar player. He and I both had a love for rock music, and sometimes we would stay after our worship rehearsals and just jam together uh, to all sorts of 90s grunge rock groups. But he had a heart for the Lord, which is the thing that I remember most about him. And, and that really came through when he would be uh, up on the worship team. And it wasn't always the way that he played that stood out to me. It was the parts in the songs where he didn't have anything to play. He was a big believer, despite being a fan of playing and shredding on the guitar. Uh, he was a big fan of less is more. And so when there needed to be uh, quiet moments in the dynamics of the song, or there just wasn't a part that he didn't need to fill, I would always notice that Bruce would stand there uh, on the stage, and he'd have his hands around the, the fretboard of his guitar, and his eyes would just be closed, and he'd be singing out in devotion to God in those moments. And he wasn't a singer. He didn't have a mic in front of him. But you could just see him continuing to sing praise to God always. And that always struck me as someone I wanted to emulate. Bruce also owned a construction business. And uh, as he started his business, he worked it from the ground up. And, uh, and it was just on the rise. And things were going really well. He had his own building that he could store his supplies and everything in and could run shop from uh, and, and answer the call to the sites and the work that he was doing. And one Saturday night, in the wee hours of the night, those hours between Saturday and Sunday, those early morning hours, there were unfortunately some teenagers that decided, hey, it's 1 a.m., this is a good time to go out and be pyromaniacs. And it never really came out as to whether or not it was intentional or whether or not it was accidental, but they went out to the site of his business place and started lighting fires. And eventually, the fire caught on, and it destroyed the entire building and it destroyed everything in the building. And so Bruce watched literally as not only the business that he had built go up in flames, but his ability to put food on the table for his family went up in flames. Now remember, I just told you this happened between Saturday night and Sunday morning. And Bruce was on schedule to play guitar on that Sunday morning. Now I want to ask you again, when you face adversity, how do you respond? I could think of all the ways I would have responded in that moment. I would have wanted to find out who set fire to my stuff and probably do something I shouldn't do. I would be distraught at the loss. I would maybe be praying and questioning and asking God why. We do that. Anybody else ever asked that before? I probably would think about a million different reasons why I wasn't in a right frame of mind to be up playing guitar that morning. But you know what Bruce did? He showed up. I remember we were in the foyer area right outside of our sanctuary, and we were talking. And I put my hand on his shoulder, and I said, man, I'm so sorry. I don't even know what to say to you. And I remember him saying, 
I don't know what to say either, but he said, I know God's got us. He was talking about him and his family. And he went on stage that morning, and he played guitar. And when the moments came where he didn't have a part to play, put his hands on his fretboard, he closed his eyes, and he lifted praise to God. And I was blown away in this moment. Because I don't know in that moment if I could have done that after what he had gone through. So I ask again, when you face adversity, what do you do? What would you do? All of us have faced adversity in some way. We have lost things. We've lost people. We've had bad days at the office. We've had days where we feel like our best intentions get away from us and we become people that we don't want to be in moments that we don't want to be in. We all face adversity, some from the small variety all the way up to the grand variety. And what do we do? As we've been studying through 2 Timothy and we've been looking at this book that, that carries this tagline of endure, this, this idea of endurance, we recognize that Paul is a person that has lived the journey of faith. And his journey is really, really interesting because when Paul came to faith on that faithful road to Damascus, when he was a prior persecutor of the church and he met the risen Jesus and he was given a new lease on life, he experienced God's grace. He experienced an opposite or a way to turn from the opposite way that he was going back to God. It's an interesting moment. Because Paul recognizes in that moment that he's been saved. But he's also told in that moment that he will learn to live and find out how much suffering he will have to endure for the Lord. And Paul, no doubt, faces suffering. He faces stoning, shipwreck, imprisonment near-death experiences, all for the sake of going and sharing the message of the crucified and risen Lord Jesus. And yet, despite the circumstances that he often finds himself in, Paul has victory. He gets to share in the victory of God because people come to the faith. People become disciples of Jesus through Paul. And yet, Paul loves these people that become disciples, and he wants to see them persist and persevere in the faith. And it's that word persevere I want us to have in mind. It's another way of saying endure. But it's one of those themes in the New Testament that we often overlook, but we shouldn't. You know, if any of you have ever looked up in a concordance or done some Google searching, You probably found all the data on how many times Jesus talks about money or how many times he references heaven and hell. And we we look up these and we say, ah, this is the most important thing that Jesus has on offer for people because he said a few words a certain number of times. But you know the theme that stands out the most throughout the entirety of the New Testament? Throughout Jesus' teaching that to be his disciple you'll have to pick up and carry your cross— Throughout Paul's admonitions that you should run the race to win the prize, that you should not give up fighting the good fight of faith, we come to the realization that one of the key elements of New Testament theology for people that want to follow the crucified and risen Jesus is to finish what you've started, to persevere to stick with it, to endure the hardship. And so as we've looked at this letter, 2 Timothy, we've noticed that Paul is constantly almost forecasting the bumps in the road that Timothy might face. And last week we we looked at the reality that one of the things Timothy needs to hold on to is the teaching of Scripture as the normative and paramount concepts of the faith 
and not to give in to other ways and not to let other people give in and be led astray. But not only to adhere to Scripture in his learning, but in his living, to live it out. But as we've already noticed in the first two chapters, living it out is difficult because you're constantly around people that will push you one direction or the other, that will make life challenging, or circumstances will come up that will knock you off the path. And that's where Paul ends his letter to Timothy in chapter 4. This notion of endurance, of perseverance. And not only speaking to his own perseverance as he sees the end for himself approaching, but admonishing Timothy to persevere as well. But it's not just that he brings back up this idea of perseverance that I want us to catch this morning. It's the how, the how to persevere. And even more importantly than the how, it's who gets us there. Because as we're about to see with Paul, he faces letdown along the way. And it turns out, when it comes to the foundation of his reliance to persevere, it's not in people. And in the same way, it shouldn't be for us either. So I want you to follow along with me. We're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 18 this morning. And you can follow along with me on on the screen or in your preferred Bible, whether you got one of these or you got one on your phone. Pick one and just follow. (laughs) uh, Paul writes, Do your best to come to me soon. For Demos, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me in ministry. I have sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come... Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus to Troas, also the books, and above all the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will pay him back for his deeds. You also must beware of him, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, of course, there's a a little bit of summary from Paul in that chapter before we get to that passage. And then he closes out uh, with uh, asks for uh, Timothy to greet uh, some folks and, and to even deliver some hellos to Timothy uh, from his side of the world that he is in. But this, this passage is interesting. It gets very, very personal. We're used to looking through Paul's letters to see the the theological details. What what does Paul say about this issue? Or how does he say that we should live in this way? We're not used to him giving a litany of names and locations and, and wondering what it all means. But it gets very personal for him because he's in prison. And prison in the Roman world was not a nice place to be. There's been some archaeological evidence that the way that they constructed these prisons were that you would be in this, you know, blockaded sort of jail cell, and there'd be a small window where light would come in. And the foundation was laid so that you would actually be a little bit below ground, but the window would be above ground. It would let just a little light in, and, and here's the, the cruel part of it. The way, it, it's almost, the Romans, by the way, were perfect at cruelty. <laughs> Not something you want to be perfect at, but they were really good. They constructed this in a way that if you were in the jail cell, 
No one on the outside could hear you. I mean, the wind would be blowing, the crowds would be about, the birds would be chirping, they'd be in conversation, they'd be doing things. They couldn't hear someone shouting out from the jail, maybe to say what they needed. But if you were in the jail, you could hear them. The sound would travel in. So you would be constantly aware of your aloneness. And you'd be aware that the world around you was going on. That people were living their lives while yours was wasting away. And when Paul gets very personal in this letter, and he starts listing off people, we can understand his predicament. He already echoes the idea that he believes his time is coming to an end. So we know that he's facing death in whatever form or fashion that is going to come about, which is in and of itself a horrible thing to have to grapple with. Even Jesus, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, awaiting his captivity, On the way to the cross, he asked his father to take this cup from him, yet not my will but yours be done. Nobody wants to face death. No one wants to face the cruelty of death that the Roman occupiers could inflict on you. But more than that, nobody wants to face it alone. Now, because of the way that the prison was structured, Uh, People could have visitors. Food items could be shared through this window opening. Somebody could get down to the opening of the cell if they know where their loved one was staying at, and they could speak to them. And for Paul, we constantly find out in his letters that he writes from prison that this was a comfort, that he at different times had people of the faith that were his brothers and sisters in Christ near him. Maybe not in the prison cell with him, but on the outside. They could break through that inflicting of being isolated for brief moments to give Paul comfort. And yet, according to him in this letter, for a variety of different reasons, everybody that he cared about and everybody that he believed cared about him had abandoned him. We're told that Demas has deserted him because he was in love with this present world. The others listed, we don't get such a negative perspective on. We, we hear that uh, Christian, Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the letters that we call the pastoral epistles, which are 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, We're assuming this is the Titus there, so Titus isn't there. Paul doesn't say that he left him for bad reasons, but he's not there when he needs him. He says, only Luke is with me, which I don't know how Luke's got to feel about that. You know, it's like, I'm here. Eh, you don't count. (laughs) I don't think that's what he's saying here, but you can tell that Paul is feeling isolated. And he asks Timothy to send others to him, and to bring his belongings to him, his sources of comfort, and even more so, his sources to carry on the mission. He tells Timothy to avoid someone that has caused him great harm. We're not told what Alexander did, but we know it was bad enough to give warning to Timothy. And then Paul jumps over and he says, "'At my first defense.'" So when you're in prison in the Roman system, you may face trial for whatever it is that you've been thrown in prison for. And you should know something else about this world. We, we have this mentality sometimes that, um, that basically uh, Paul might have been on the street corner proclaiming the gospel and someone didn't like what he said, so they went and arrested him. But that's not always exactly how these sorts of things go down. What's more likely is, is that the contents of the gospel inspired people to change. Isn't that funny how God inspires people to change? And you know, if you live in this world and your behavior changes, your perspectives change, and what is important or what was important is no longer important and what is now important is, you even change 
I don't know, things like your work habits and your family relationships and the way you communicate with your friends and the people that you pass on the roadside. And when this much change enters into a person and it comes out of them and they start to operate in different ways, it can stir up trouble for the people that benefit from their former way of life. Like there's a story in Acts where Paul actually gets fed up with a woman that was, uh, that was proclaiming all sorts of things and following them along and pointing out who Paul is. And he just wanted to silence her because she was speaking all sorts of things. And so he, he drives an unclean spirit out of her. And she comes to the faith. And it turns out there were people making money off of her ability to predict the future or whatever other thing they had concocted to make money off of, and they aren't happy with it, so they stir up trouble for Paul because of the message taking root in this woman's life. And if you stir up trouble with somebody, maybe you bring along false accusations. Maybe you blame them for your business going out of whack, and you bring litigation on them. Whatever it is, Paul has been put in prison for a reason such as this. And so he's got to go on trial for it. And while he's awaiting his trial, he gets to sit and rot in jail in this situation that I described earlier. And so, at his first defense, he says, no one, no one, none of the people he's mentioned earlier, Nobody else that he can think of that are fellow members of the faith came to his defense. He says, all deserted me. And then I love this. He says, may it not be counted against them. He sounds like Jesus here. When Jesus says from the cross, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Even Paul has grace for his enemies. He may tell Timothy to stay away from a no good one, but he still asks God not to hold it against them. Because he knows that God did not hold his sin against him and saved him on the road to Damascus. But then he says in verse 17, But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. Now, this phrase, I was rescued from the lion's mouth, is an intriguing one. One of the ways that, uh, that Romans would, you know, put people that were found guilty of something uh, in a bad spot is they would put them in the Colosseum games. Sometimes that involved people being thrown to animals like lions. And we know from history that sometimes Christians found their way and to the lion's den, and it didn't end well. So we can read this from a literal vantage point, that Paul didn't suffer that fate after his first defense, although now he's just back in prison again, awaiting his next defense. But we also know that in the Old Testament, like in the Psalms, there are points where the idea of God rescuing somebody from the lion's mouth is a way of saying that God has rescued them from death. We think of the story of Daniel, and we think of the psalmist writing these kinds of words. And the idea here is that God is the deliverer from death. Paul is basically saying, I could have ended up after my first defense in death. I had nobody here to defend me. And rather than putting up a defense for myself, I took this opportunity to share the message of faith as my defense. And God empowered me to do so. He's basically saying, when everybody else failed to show up for me, God did not. And he concludes that the Lord will rescue him from every evil attack and save him for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I want you to catch one last thing here. He says, The Lord stood by me and gave me strength 
So it was God who emboldened him, who kept him on his feet in his defense. But it's for what and for why did God do so? Well, it was so that through him the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. For Paul, he always wants to pay forward the grace that he was given. Everybody that has ever received anything good in life wants to pass it on. When you receive a good thing, you almost can't keep quiet about it. And again, we know this from the trivialities of life. If you find a favorite restaurant, you go tell 10 people, you've got to eat here, it's the best thing I've ever had. If your favorite team wins something, you can't stop smiling about it. And people ask, why'd you have a good day? Did, did something really good? Did you get a good, good promotion or something? Oh no, my favorite team won a game that doesn't really matter anymore. But then, when something really good happens, when someone treats you well, when they come through for you, when things aren't looking good, you tell other people about it. And not only do you tell them about it, but you long to be able to do it for somebody else. I have to be honest with you, and I didn't do anything deserving of this, but I was in line at McDonald's like a couple weeks ago. I eat McDonald's. It's okay, I'm not ashamed to admit it. And I went through the line, and this, this, uh, the, the lady that was at the register all I did was I, I, said, I said hello, and then I said thank you, and she handed me the receipt. That's it. I might have smiled. I try to smile at people. You never know if they haven't got a smile for the day from anybody. So, And she looks me in the eyes, and she goes, thank you for being nice to me. The person before you screamed at me for about five minutes. And I was like, Wow. I didn't know my hello and thank you was going to be that meaningful to someone. But again, when you do something even small, kind for someone that's experienced adversity, you don't know what it will do for them. It just might keep them going. And for Paul, the thing that keeps him going is that he received grace from God. And he is going to go to the ends of the earth through heck and high water, I can say it that way, in order to share the good news with other people so that they can receive the grace he did. And that is powerful. And yet, not only is it powerful, he is fully relying on God to be the one to get him through it. The people that abandon him, he says, I hope God doesn't hold it against them, but he stayed with me and stayed by my side to keep me upright, to be able to share the message so that people could hear it. And here I am, rotting in a prison. And the only thing I want for you, Timothy, is to continue on in your faith, to continue on in your calling, and if you get a chance, bring me the things that might help me in my mission continuing until I meet that glorious moment where I can be with Jesus forever. At the end of it all, Paul tells Timothy throughout this letter, you will face temptations to knock you off the path. You will hear doctrines or hear others sharing doctrines with other people that are going to knock them off the path. Stay sound in yours. You will hear him remind him constantly of the faith that he inherited from his grandmother and his mother and to keep it and the one that he inherited from him. But the last thing that you hear from Paul is, when all else fails, God does not. And that's why I want us to remember today that through challenges, God's power ensures our perseverance. We cannot do it on our own. We can't even do it with the help of other people. God can use other people to help us do it. And God can give us the might to do it. But it is from Him and Him alone. And yet He still calls us to persevere. 
But he doesn't ask us to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, to get over it and put a smile on our face when life is going difficult, but to be fully and totally reliant on him to ensure that we persevere, that we run the race to win the prize, that we fight the good fight of faith, that we carry our cross, that we deal with our burdens in a way that God sees us through to live out our faith. That is Paul's message of endurance. So when you face adversity, how do you respond? I know for me, over the years, one of the most challenging aspects to not only my faith, but my calling to be a minister of the gospel has been coming to grips with the fact that people will let you down. I don't know how this happened, but despite not growing up in the church, I I had a bit of a rosy, optimistic outlook at people. I, I believed for the longest time that, you know, when I faced bullies growing up as a kid, well, they're just kids like me, so they'll grow up and grow out of it. I assumed adults would just naturally become mature people when they're older. I've learned the hard way that that's not always true. I'm not talking about any of you in here. I'm just saying in general. But one of the hard realities of that is is not necessarily when it's the people that you meet on the day-to-day on the job, but the people that are in your life that you call friends that know everything about you and that you think that you know everything about. I'll never forget the first few times that the D word, divorce, entered the equation for my fellow 20-somethings and then 30-somethings. And I thought that it was on me to go in and fix every situation because I thought that my calling was to be the fixer. And I tried and I tried. I I showed up when they needed coffee. I showed up when they were crying on their living room floor. I took the call at midnight. And my wife did those things alongside with me. And then they didn't change. And I started to ask, what am I even doing here? I thought that things were supposed to get better. I thought that when people grew up, they were supposed to get more mature and they weren't supposed to act like knuckleheads doing these things. What's going on here? And then my good friend, Dee Dee Bacon of Mount Carmel Christian Church, the lead minister, one day we were were talking and I I was in tears and frustrated with a particular situation. He put his hand on my shoulder And he said to me, you know, it took me a while to learn this lesson too, but I'm going to give it to you the way that I learned it. You need to stop trying to fix people because only God can do that. And it was a hard lesson to swallow, an even harder one to learn. But I realize that when I consider what Paul calls Timothy to do, and I realize what God has called me to do, and I realize what God has called those of you who have decided to be disciples of Jesus to do, there's one constant in the call to persevere. And it isn't your willpower. And it isn't on finding some more perfect, more mature people of faith to carry you through. It's to rely on the power of God to change you and to change others. And when we understand that, we can endure the highs and lows of life. We can finish the race. We can fight the good fight of faith. And we can carry our cross. No matter how hard things get, When you face adversity, and I don't know if you've caught, I haven't said if. When you face adversity, how will you respond? 
Well, I can tell you this. If you're a follower of Jesus, whether you respond and stick with it will be totally determined on your reliance on the power of God and God alone. I hope when you came in that you took a communion packet this morning. I already mentioned that Jesus in the garden asked the Lord God, the Father, to take this cup from him, the cup of suffering he was about to endure. And yet he said, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus constantly as the Son worked in tandem with the Spirit to guide his every move by the will of the Father and the Spirit's power, not only to make disciples, not only to perform perform wondrous works, not only to deliver powerful teaching, but to endure the suffering that he endured for our sake. That grace that Paul knew and shared to the ends of the earth. Jesus was empowered by the Father through the Spirit to go to the cross. And every week when we take communion, we remember what he did for us by his power. And we remember that it is by his power alone that we can carry our cross too. So I'm going to ask that you take a moment to reflect on what God has done for us through his son Jesus. And after that time of reflection, we will take communion together as a church family. I invite you to take this bread and eat. This is his body which is given for us. And in the same way, I invite you to take and drink from this cup. This is his blood which is poured out for us. Please pray with me. Dear Lord God, we uh, thank you for another Sunday in which we can come together as a church family and worship you in spirit and in truth. No matter at what point on our faith journey we're at, we are brothers and sisters in your son Jesus, and we are his body. And I pray, God, that as we not only consider your grace, but we also consider your call to endure, to persevere, and to persist in our faith, that we will not only be mindful of the shared plight that we have and the plight of those disciples that went before us, uh, but that we'll be emboldened to lean on you and you alone, that we will uh, share that goodness and power with one another to spur each other on to love and good deeds. And that uh, despite whatever highs and lows we face, that we will be a light to those in the world outside of these walls uh, because we know that you love us and that you love them. And we thank you that we have been uh, so affirmed and so brought in by your love. Let us be bearers of love and light to the world around us in the same way that others were to us. And pray these things in your son Jesus' name.